first of all, I would like to thank uh, Wei for the warm uh, invitation and introduction, and of course, our dear Ravinder for bringing us together every year at FLAPS. So um, today I am uh, uh, very happy to gather with you at 8.30 a.m. on a Sunday um, to go through some uh, um, basics about uh, electronic tattoos. Since uh, this is uh, also the first tutorial today, I am trying um, to cover uh, more broadly of this field instead of just my own research. Um, I will give you an overview and then go through those uh, uh, perspectives one by one. At the end, I will uh, focus on a few examples of uh, um, devices and applications from my group, all right? And uh, because this is a tutorial, one and a half hours. So uh, the main goal is uh, actually not me really presenting to you, is really how much you get out of this. So please feel free to interrupt me anytime if you have any question. It's also a very intimate group. So uh, let's just uh, uh, relax and uh, um, have a uh, discussion and brainstorm together. All right. So. Um, First, uh, let me give you some motivation for uh, electronic tattoos, and then I'll tell you what are electronic tattoos. So in the past, mm, we can say that humans and robots or machines are on the two extremities of the spectrum, because we always use uh, things like a soft, intelligent, energy efficient to describe human, but we use the opposite words uh, rigid, discreet, uh, dumb, uh, power hungry to describe robots. However, um, right now, actually, uh, all of us are witnessing a great transition, a very exciting period when humans are more approaching robots in the sense that humans are trying to become digital, computational, um, cyber connected to the internet, and also expandable or augmentable. Whereas robots are trying to mimic humans to become uh, softer, more dexterous, more intelligent. Now we have all uh, seen or even used uh, GPT and a large language model to uh, have a sense of how intelligent they could be nowadays, right? They can beat 99% uh, of us in all kinds of uh, standard tests already. And um, um, still uh, robots and machines have to carry up and um, catch up with the human energy uh, efficiency, right? So uh, because of this uh, uh, big motivation and background, uh, we are now thinking of um, first, how do we digitize the human body, right? So such that human body can be uh, more uh, uh, connected to the internet, can be even more computational, and can be better understood by machines and robots. And uh, we can have uh, a lot of exciting uh, use in the cyberspace. So uh, that is not an easy task. Why? Because our human body is uh, continuously um, radiating very distributed from head to toe multimodal, continuous, and personal data about our health, our status, our intentions, or emotions. It is uh, very important to notice that um, human body uh, has a distributed data. For example, from the head, we have the brain wave, uh, which are called electroencephalogram, or EEG, if we measure non-invasively. If we measure invisibly, we can even reach uh, the level of a single neuron. And uh, we uh, also have an electrocardiogram on the chest and an electromyogram on any piece of muscle, specific piece of muscle. And those are all electrical signals, right? But we also have mechanical signals such as respiration, uh, the heartbeat induced chest vibration called the seismocardiogram or SCG. Uh, we have blood pressure. Those are uh, motion, mechanical signals. We also have thermal signals, and we also have uh, um, uh, our uh, uh, chemical biomarkers that uh, um, we have expert, uh, Professor Wei Gao, who will tell you more today. And um, 
those kind of uh, signals, if we can mm, well acquire them, not just at hospital or lab settings, but in everyday life, in ambulatory settings, uh, the ultimate goal is for us to build a digital twin of the human body in the uh, cyber world, right? So this is uh, actually a concept originated from NASA back in 1980s. Uh, when they try to um, simulate and model spacecrafts because they are too expensive to experiment on. So uh, therefore they put uh, thousands of sensors and uh, they build digital twin of spacecrafts in the um, digital world and perform simulations. So the same idea here, if we can build a digital twin nowadays, right? There are digital twin of building, of bridges, now there is even digital twin of uh, Singapore. Uh, if uh, Ben um, is here today, we can ask him. So they are trying to do urban planning, energy um, modeling, and uh, even policy deployment simulation before they actually implement those kind of uh, uh, physical uh, uh, interventions. So the same idea can be applied to our human body, right? Um, if we can digitize the human body, uh, we can unleash a very broad range of applications, not just limited to what I list here, but you can also propose um, ideas, right? Which include uh, telemedicine or personalized medicine because all the data is about you and specifically you, not others. And a mobile health, um, we can track the health of like elderly aging, in place in their own houses or our uh, newborns uh, wherever they are and uh, our athletes in the field uh, or in the game. And then uh, also after digitizing the human body, our machines and robots can better understand and interact with us because uh, they can, um, because in terms of um, uh, physical interaction with the human, it is very important to know the status so that they can respond accordingly. Or even in the future, we want to have a human caring robots, like a nursing robots, babysitting robots, first aid robots, then they need to know the um, biometrics of the human. And uh, in terms of uh, connecting human to the uh, uh, XR, uh, uh, augmented or virtual reality or metaverse, right? Uh, currently, we can only uh, uh, probably track their eye movement using the VR glasses and track their hand movement using a hand um, uh, uh, remote control, but not much beyond that. But in the future, can we uh, know the human uh, mood, right, attention, uh, or um, mental capacity, or fatigue? Uh, and so on, right? And uh, better engage or like keep humans safe. So um, this is uh, uh, from the human side, actually. Uh, uh, there are also a lot of research going on from the robot side to develop uh, soft uh, sensors for robot to wear. And uh, I call those e-skins, yeah? For the soft sensors for human to wear, I call them e-tattoos. And um, uh, there are soft actuators. Uh, there are a lot of control theories. There is uh, the uh, swarm um, planning and uh, human robot interaction and so on. So today our focus is e tattoos and we focus on digitizing the human body. So given those background now, uh, let's uh, take a look at human body and uh, think about the challenges why uh, so far, we only have a limited success of digitizing the human body. That is uh, because of really a multi-scale and a multi-modal challenge. So uh, in this uh, invited review paper, we try to highlight uh, those uh, challenges in a, a, a more like zoomed out uh, big picture view. So in terms of uh, characteristic length scales, our body actually has a very broad range of length scales, right? Our, uh, the surface roughness of our tissue are, could be uh, as low as uh, uh, hundreds of nanometers, right? 
And then uh, the organs are like a millimeter, centimeters, and even the, mm, some joints could be like a, a tens of centimeters. So it's a, a large uh, multi uh, order of magnitude um, span of length scales that if you want to have electronics, you need to cover this kind of length scale. In terms of the uh, um, mechanical property and uh, specifically Young's modulus, which is the uh, elasticity, um, elastic uh, um, stiffness of the material, then um, man-made material, which are on the top and uh, uh, tissue material on the bottom, uh, they could have a big mismatch if uh, we only focus on inorganic electronic materials like uh, silicon, metal, or even 2D materials. They are extremely stiff materials. Of course, very high performance electronically, but uh, um, compared with our uh, range of modulus of tissue, uh, soft tissue, it's uh, again, uh, order some magnitude mismatch. And of course, that's why uh, there are a lot of uh, exciting and uh, uh, fast development on uh, soft electronic materials, um, including uh, organic um, semiconductors, conductors, uh, liquid metal. Liquid metal is actually here, right? It, the it modulus is zero. A and uh, um, uh, many composites, hydrogels as well. And in terms of the uh, uh, mechanical deformation, right? So uh, this is uh, widely uh, discussed uh, in previous review articles, but in terms of mechanical deformation, actually we are trying to uh, highlight the range of um, um, uh, uh, strengths that are achievable by the bio tissues. So even if uh, you think of our brain, which is quite a static, um, but actually because of our breathing, the brain wobbles, uh, with uh, strengths uh, of uh, a few percent. And when there is an uh, impact, the strain can go actually uh, up to 8%. And uh, sometimes it can cause traumatic brain injury. And a heartbeat goes up to 20%, the surface of the heart. And um, uh, normally our skin uh, stretchability is uh, uh, 40 to 50% before it breaks, but when our skins are stretched by 20%, we start to feel pain. So usually we use 20% as the stretchability of human skin, right? 20% uh, is also the so-called ouch limit. I, I call it ouch limit. And uh, uh, at those joints like wrists or um, knees, the strain can be uh, actually more than 50%. And there is actually a figure D, which I don't have space to show. That is about the wide range of adhesion between um, man-made materials and uh, um, bio tissues. So it could also be uh, orders of magnitude difference. Um, and the inorganic materials are in general uh, having poor adhesion with bio tissue. Organic materials, uh, hydrogels have much better adhesion with bio tissue. So all of those uh, um, uh, basic characteristics uh, pose uh, fundamental challenges to build those kind of body conformable electronics. And uh, um, we try to um, summarize a lot of uh, body conformable electronics out in the literature, of course, not uh, an exhaustive uh, list. Um, today, our focus is just the uh, epidermal uh, electronic tattoos, but I just want to mention that um, a lot of those uh, materials, design, manufacturing, um, uh, principles we talk about today are also applicable to um, implantable uh, in vivo devices. So uh, let's uh, uh, think about uh, uh, wearables, right? ETA2 is a special type of wearable non-invasive devices. Conventionally, uh, we know that uh, wearables based on wafer-based uh, electronics are intrinsically rigid, bulky, and um, they only have uh, limited sites. The mostly popular are uh, wrists. Nowadays, we also have smart brains, right? So um, they are uh, very uh, powerful nowadays. For example, Apple Watch has FDA cleared uh, capability of uh, atrial fibrillation detection. And um, uh, smart rings are also trying to pursue FDA approval. Um, but the uh, thing is, again, if you recall that, our human body has distributed signals across the body. 
you cannot just rely on the wrist measurement to represent the whole body. Just like you cannot use a, a tire pressure sensor to re, uh, represent the whole car, the same thing, right? So the limited size is a big issue for digitizing the human body. So what we would like to um, advocate is that if we could manufacture ultra thin, how thin, hair thin, let's say, um, just uh, tens of microns or, or even uh, sub-microns, and it's skin soft uh, electronics based on either organic or inorganic electronics, uh, such that they can be direct, readily patched on any part of our skin uh, to acquire multimodal signals and wirelessly transmit them or even perform uh, edge computing, then uh, we are able to do a much better job of the human body digitization. So, uh, of course, uh, uh, this work is from um, uh, uh, Hyun but uh, I will tell you the history of e-tattoos. So um, first, let's uh, think a little bit more about uh, um, stretchability, right? So in the past, um, we all know that uh, um, stiff materials are orders of magnitude uh, higher than our skin, and how to make them stretchable without compromising their electronic performance is actually a big challenge. But the solution uh, actually turns out to be quite simple. If uh, you have this inspiration from compression springs, compression springs made out of metal, they are very stiff intrinsically, but if they are coiled in 3D, they become uh, stretchable and compressible. Similarly, if you have a, an aluminum foil, this is actually a paper cut, and you can cut it into a two-dimensional spring, which we call serpentine ribbons, then they can become stretchable and uh, re releasable, uh, just like a 3D uh, spring. And the beauty is that the material property in terms of electronic optical properties, they are not changed at all. Only the shape and the mechanical property is changed. And um, this uh, is uh, achieved by accommodating this end by end-to-end -end stretching um, with uh, this rigid body rotation of the ribbons. And there's a little bit of uh, strain concentration at the crest, but still this uh, um, crest strain after 114% end by end stretch is only 2%. This 2% is the interatomic distance change. That's the intrinsic strain. And uh, by this kind of um, uh, serpentine design, um, there are a lot of um, um, uh, uh, devices we can achieve. And this is applicable to any materials, uh, whether uh, metal or uh, silicon, indium uh, uh, tin oxide, or even organic semiconductors. And the mechanics uh, actually involve both, uh, this is numerical simulation, analytical simulation, and experiments. And uh, the ribbon doesn't have to be passive or uh, like uh, just uh, conductive uh, or, or, or dielectric. The ribbon itself could be an active material like a piezoelectric material or uh, a um, liquid uh, uh, crystal elastomer, right? Then you can even have actuation. So we have done a lot of uh, uh, mechanics work in this space. Um, one thing I would like to highlight, in addition to stretchability of serpentines, is the softness of serpentines. So from our um, model, as well as experiments, actually, uh, uh, and, and uh, simulation, we have proved that um, if you just uh, take the same ribbon and uh, change the geometry into serpentine shape, the force you need to apply to stretch by the same amount um, applied to the serpentine ribbon could be orders of magnitude lower than the counterpart uh, ribbon. And this alpha is this uh, joining angle. That's what we use to define a horseshoe-shaped serpentine. And um, this, uh, uh, the larger the alpha, the more torturous, the more wavy the serpentine is. So this orders of magnitude reduction in stiffness gives us hope to build a skin-like electronic tattoos out of even organic, conventional organic electronic materials. Does that make sense? Question. Yeah. yeah. 
share. So, what is the, the, the destination in the bottom? And then, uh, when I focused on the wow, wave, uh -huh. so uh, I'm curious why the frame is unsymmetric. Uh, it is a symmetric uh, if you compare top and bottom, right? So, yeah. so, oh, but the, uh, ah, the that is because of uh, the um, buckling broke the symmetry. So uh, I, I didn't have a ribbon, but if you uh, try to cut a ribbon like this and stretch, you will see that it will go out of plane a little bit. The auto plane deformation is called buckling. And in this case, the buckling is not symmetric. So that's what broke the symmetry. But actually it's anti-symmetric. So if you look from the other side, uh, this uh, strain distribution is identical to this side. But the shape, the geometry is uh, not symmetric. Yeah, great observation. But you're saying that um, this is applicable to all materials, but I, I guess it depends that you you must have that rotation. I mean, if you have a very stiff material like iron, you can't do that. Oh, uh, this is actually a thin film uh, serpentine ribbon. You can build an iron ribbon like this. It will still behave like this. Uh-huh, right. uh-huh, uh-huh. So, so, but uh, that's a very good point. So whether it buckles or not actually depends on the aspect ratio of the cross-section. If uh, the width is much larger than the thickness, it prefers to buckle. Yeah, if the thickness is much larger than the width, it's a thick ribbon, then it doesn't buckle. It's just in play, right? So buckling gives you more strain relief, but buckling is not preferred for ETA2 because uh, we don't want uh, a gap between our device and our skin. But uh, usually ETA2 has uh, laminates on both top and bottom. So the confinement from the substrate and the skin will also um, limit the buckling. Any other questions? Great questions, and uh, thank you for um, asking. So I'm happy to clarify whenever uh, you have uh, uh, questions or thoughts, right? So we're here to also exchange our ideas. If you have any um, great ideas to share, please. Uh, we're also always looking for new directions, right? So anyway, um, based on this kind of um, a very simple idea of uh, making intrinsically stiff materials stretchable and soft, um, this uh, we uh, first uh, invented the so-called epidermal electronics, or now I call them uh, eta tattoos. So again, those are hair thin, uh, skin soft, non-invasive electronic patches that can be applied on any part of our skin and behave just like a secondary skin, just like a second epidermis. And therefore, uh, it is able to deform however your skin deforms, uh, like a stretch or wrinkle, and without imposing any mechanical feeling or perception, right? And the mechanical uh, modulus, uh, according to this stress strain measurement, is uh, uh, comparable with the skin modulus. But uh, we can see that beyond 20%, uh, skin becomes uh, highly nonlinear. Yeah, and that's uh, when damage start to happen in the skin without uh, fracturing. So in the first demonstration, we applied uh, ETA2 on human neck to measure the uh, speaking uh, induced uh, uh, neck muscle movement called uh, uh, neck EMG. Those are the blue waves. And um, after extracting those features, which are the red waves, we are able to recognize the feature uh, pretty easily and use uh, what you are saying to play a Sokoban game, pushing the box up, down, left, right, but not through the voice, only through the neck muscle uh, movement. And that means uh, even if we don't really make a voice, 
uh, we can still try to um, train the model and recognize the pattern for uh, covert communication. So um, this is uh, how we uh, uh, first demonstrate the um, uh, skin-like um, behavior of uh, e tattoos. Uh, this is actually Dehyung's arm. Um, we were doing the filming at uh, UIUC uh, Beckman Institute at that time. So um, we fabricated this e tattoo uh, only based on inorganic materials. The goldish part are all gold. We had a silicon um, uh, uh, solar cell and a transistor uh, on this tattoo. We also have a gold antenna um, uh, that can uh, also light up an LED wirelessly. So um, because it's just uh, simply laminated on the skin uh, and uh, there is no really added adhesive, it's just Vannevar's adhesion. So when you're done with the measurement, it's just very easy to peel them off. Uh, this is a, a layer of 30 micron thin uh, Ecoflex substrate supporting all the electronics. We will talk about the fabrication later, but in this case, the key step is the transfer printing. All the electronics were fabricated on silicon wafer. And after we are done with the, all the circuits, we do a final transfer printing to lift the circuit from the silicon wafer and transfer on to bound it to the Ecoflux substrate. That's the trickiest part, actually. And uh, Daehyung is uh, by far the best hands who can do the transfer printing with the highest yield. So um, uh, after uh, the first publication of uh, e-tattoos, uh, we actually uh, start to think what's the real uniqueness of e-tattoos compared with conventional wearable electronics. And um, here I would like to summarize a few uh, main features. Uh, first is that we can have a, a conformable contact between the soft and thin e tattoo and the microscopically rough skin surface. If you have uh, just a, like, a, um, like a, a, an Apple watch sitting on your uh, skin, uh, microscopically, actually, uh, it's only making kind of a limited point contacts with the skin. And this kind of conformability uh, really sets apart e-tattoos from other wearables because this kind of large contact area ensures low contact impedance if it's a, a conductor. And that uh, low contact impedance ensures uh, better signal fidelity, especially the electrophysiological signal fidelity. And also, if you want to deliver some voltage to do like an electrotactile st stimulation or just a, um, a, a thermal stimulation, we just uh, need less stimulation voltage. Second, um, across this kind of large contact interface, we can have much better, uh, not just the electrical signal, but also mass, heat, light, and vibration transfer across the interface compared with this kind of uh, um, uh, limited contact interface. And also um, this uh, interface adhesion is uh, usually not enhanced. You can if you need to, but even if it's just a natural Vannevar's adhesion, um, if uh, you have ultra thin and ultra soft device according to fracture mechanics, which tells us that the driving force for delamination scales with the thickness and modulus of the thin film. So if your thickness is so small, the modulus is so small, the driving force for detachment is so small. It's, which means it doesn't need a lot of adhesion to stay on, even under a skin deformation. We know that our skin is deformable up to 20%. And because there's no delamination and the device always follow your skin deformation, there is no relative motion across the interface and that will minimize the uh, so-called um, motion artifacts. For example, tribal electricity. Right? We know if there is relative motion and friction, there's going to be a lot of charge generation, which is useful for energy harvesting, but uh, which is detrimental for uh, signal acquisition. 
And also, um, uh, if you want to measure the local strain of the skin very accurately, if there is slippage, you will under measure the strain. But if there's no slippage, you will be able to measure the true strain, right? And uh, um, if you have very um, sensitive strain gauges that can measure the actual strain, then you can also have a very nice uh, uh, hand um, gesture recognition system. And also, um, this is actually promoted by uh, Professor Somnia's work. So if you uh, also have um, not just ultra thin, ultra soft, but also porous uh, e-tattoos that can really uh, conform very well to the skin and it can induce uh, uh, no effect on natural uh, skin motion or skin sensation, right? We use our finger and even our um, other part of the skin to uh, sense touch, temperature, moisture all the time. If uh, you have a rigid watch blocking that, uh, this part of the skin is not able to sense uh, very uh, uh, accurately. But if you have ultra thin and ultra soft and even breathable electronic tattoo, you are able to still uh, maintain all those uh, skin sensation capabilities. And if uh, we can even make this uh, electronic tattoo a little bit transparent and make it less visible, it can also reduce the social stigma of the user. Because a lot of times uh, patients are already under a lot of uh, mental stress and they don't want others to see that they have to wear all kinds of uh, sensors for their health. So if your e-tattoo could be uh, less visible, that can reduce the social stigma. And uh, this list can go on depending on um, the application and the, uh, the uh, future development, but this is what I come up with and I just want to share with you. So the uh, question is now, um, conformability is so important and uh, so critical for e-tattoo, how can we achieve it? How thin and how soft exactly do we have to be to uh, achieve this uh, conformability? Well, uh, that can leverage some um, um, fundamental uh, mechanics, but it's really not really uh, uh, advanced mechanics. This is very basic elasticity, uh, 2D elasticity. So um, we just uh, consider three uh, different scenarios. One is non-conformable, one is partially conformable, one is fully conformable. And we assume the skin has a sinusoidal uh, roughness, which is uh, not realistic at all. If uh, uh, your skin looks like a sinusoidal surface, you should see a doctor. But uh, just for uh, mechanics, the modeling, uh, this is a, a reasonable simplification. And just keep in mind that actually our skin roughness uh, vary a lot, which was shown in the um, uh, scale earlier. So uh, for like a very, uh, uh, for young skin or, or like a facial skin, uh, the roughness is uh, below 30 micron. But uh, uh, for skin our foot, uh, or, or our back, it could be more than 100 micron rough, right? So the roughness can change a lot. The stiffness also changes a lot, actually. So here we uh, don't uh, really consider all of those uh, uh, different varieties of skin types. We just uh, uh, give a known uh, skin roughness, just average skin roughness uh, by given the amplitude and wavelengths and we uh, just uh, use a, a reasonable skin stiffness. And then um, we consider all the energies involved in this uh, uh, film conforming to skin configuration. It involves the bending energy of the membrane, the stretching energy of the membrane, which is the membrane energy, the substrate energy, which is skin, uh, elastic energy, because when the thin film conform to skin, the skin also deform a little bit, dragged a little bit by the tattoo. And then the interfacial adhesion, adhesion energy, only those four energies. And um, by using this uh, sinusoidal uh, configuration, we can actually have analytical expression for each of them. And then we can do an analytical energy up energy minimization to find the equilibrium status. And that is uh, given in this result.
So um, by solving this um, uh, uh, energy problem, we have found the equilibrium uh, condition, which gives us the result of conformability as a function of the film thickness or eta-2 thickness, uh, given the interfacial adhesion, also a very mild uh, adhesion. So it tells us that uh, below seven micron, uh, and this mem this membrane is assumed to be uh, uh, as soft as skin. Huh? So like an ecoflex is uh, relatively um, uh, similar to skin. So below seven micron, this ecoflex membrane is predicted to be able to achieve 100% conformability like this. And this is a Professor Rogers' uh, experiments, but uh, we didn't uh, use any um, fitting parameter. So we can still see that our result can uh, well capture the experimental result. And we predict that beyond seven micron, there is no equilibrium status in between. So which means once, if you gradually increase the eta-2 thickness beyond seven micron, the conformability would drop all the way from 100% to 24%. There's no equilibrium in between. There's no solution. This is actually a mechanical snap through snap in instability. There, uh, it's uh, unstable in between. And uh, 36 micron, this is the next available experiment. Uh, we predicted almost no conformability. And 100 micron, forget about it. Yeah, so this is our prediction. And um, if uh, you don't know the adhesion, but you know the thickness, then I can plot another conformability versus adhesion plot, which will also look like this, uh, or, 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 or like this, actually. So which means that there will be a critical adhesion beyond which it can achieve full conformability, below which it cannot. And there's also instability. And let's say you know the thickness, you know the adhesion, but you don't know how soft you have to make your eta 2 which means how to design your serpentine, right? The serpentine stiffness is tunable. So then uh, we can give you another plot, conformability versus uh, um, soft uh, versus stiffness of the eta 2, below which it can achieve full conformability, beyond which it can not achieve conformability, right? So that's the beauty of the analytical modeling um, that can give you uh, all kinds of, you can um, play with the, the uh, variables and the outputs. If you don't uh, believe the uh, first example, let's give you a second example. So um, after we have this model, uh, we start to uh, think about uh, whether we can build the thinnest eta 2 um, out of uh, the thinnest material, which is graphene, right? But uh, as a monolayer graphene, it is just um, too fragile and uh, too um, easy to disappear, uh, not uh, easy to handle. So we actually had to use a supporting polymer to support graphene. And um, when we do the web transfer of large area monolayer CVD graphene, PMMA is the default uh, material we use to facilitate the transfer, right? It's just that uh, most people after transfer would uh, uh, remove PMMA and have a uh, monolayer large area uh, polycrystalline graphene, but we didn't remove PMMA. But the problem is PMMA is a much stiffer polymer than Ecoflex, right? Ecoflex is a uh, modulus is 70 kilopascal. PMMA is like a polyimide or PET, right? Gigapascal, gigapascal modulus. So in this case, we have to have another prediction of the conformability. And for a much steeper polymer, we predict, uh, and the graphene stiffness is negligible because it's too thin compared with PMMA. And we can predict in our theory that 475 nanometer is the critical thickness below which it can fully conform, beyond which it can uh, go almost uh, all the way to zero, right? Like a, Five ten percent. So, following this uh, theoretical guidance, we actually designed our graphene eta two to have a backing layer thickness of uh, below four hundred seventy five nanometer. And uh, um, the mm, manufactured graphene eta two indeed fully conformed to the skin very well. We also manufactured a uh, graphene on one micron thick polyimide, and it didn't conform at all. So. 
which means although this is a very simple 2D elasticity model, analytical model even, we could still achieve a pretty reasonable uh, theoretical guidance to design the thickness or the stiffness or the interfacial adhesion. And uh, keep in mind that um, if your um, device is very stiff and very thick, if you can enhance the adhesion between the device and the skin, you can still conform the two by dragging the skin all the way to conform to your device. Does that make sense? So conformability is a, a mutual uh, approaching uh, each other. Well, so given those kind of basic understandings of e-tattoos, um, I would like to give you an overview of uh, where we are today. So uh, starting 2011, we published uh, the first uh, uh, epidermal electronics or ETA2. Uh, now, um, after 12 years, we have achieved a lot of uh, new, uh, actually not the, the whole community, right? Now it's a, a community of uh, probably thousands of researchers have achieved a lot of new materials, a lot of new properties and a lot of new applications. Right. Uh, specifically in terms of uh, properties, uh, at the first we were trying to emphasize like stretchable, conformable to the skin, and later imperceptible, and uh, also closed loop um, sensing and uh, therapeutics, and breathable, right? Porous and uh, um, letting sweat to evaporate, and multi-layer reconfigurable like a Lego. It can disassemble and reassemble. Uh, self healable material and self healable device, high resolution uh, active matrix based uh, pressure sensing matrix, uh, self adhesive uh, materials. Usually, the substrate could be engineered to have adhesion, but uh, for example, gold or silver nanowire usually don't have good adhesion with the skin. But uh, those electrodes hopefully can also be adhesive to the skin one day, and uh, you can use things like P dot PSS or other materials. And um, sensation um, interference free electronic tattoos, antibacteria e e tattoos, and it can go on, right? In terms of um, uh, materials, uh, that's what we're going to go through one by one. And application-wise, um, it, it now uh, is uh, really covering almost uh, all aspects uh, from uh, um, uh, health tracking to human-robot interaction to metaverse interaction and so on. So in terms of those uh, uh, modalities, like we mentioned, um, we have electrical, narratives, mechanical, thermal, uh, optical, and uh, chemical, right? And uh, you can even do a fusion of a multi-modal, a multi-location um, sensor uh, during a long time period to achieve a lot of those uh, um, important applications. So, um, I just want to highlight a few uh, uh, big contributors in this field. Of course, again, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just uh, trying to recognize that we have uh, so many uh, wonderful researchers uh, contributing to this field. And that's how we could achieve this kind of progress after 12 years. Um, they are all over the world, and uh, some of them are here, and uh, we just want to thank them for really uh, pushing the frontier of uh, e-tattoos. So that's like an overview, which hopefully give you some sense of uh, what are e-tattoos, what are the properties and uh, uh, goals we are trying to achieve. And um, next, I want to uh, go through the individual topics, but yeah, feel free. So you showed all the parameters that you could measure. Which one is the most challenging and why? Ah, uh, that uh, depends on who you talk to, right? So if you talk to Wei, he will tell you chemical ones, right? Um, so uh, for me, I would say um, it's really the, uh, mm, I didn't have it here. It's really the uh, blood pressure. So um, blood pressure is a mechanical signal, but uh, um, the problem is currently there are so already so many uh, modalities out there trying to uh, 
correlate with blood pressure, right? You probably have heard of uh, uh, pulse waveform analysis, pulse arrival time analysis, um, um, uh, 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 ultrasound uh, sensing, and so on. But uh, really, uh, there is uh, for for the uh, medical people, uh, they don't buy any of those, right? So non-invasive uh, continuous blood pressure. Uh, uh, recording is uh, still an outstanding challenge. And um, ultrasound, I think personally, uh, ultrasound, uh, wearable ultrasound is emerging. And uh, I think it's very promising because uh, ultrasound is the one that can give you the uh, real time hemodynamics of the blood flow, of the mechanical um, uh, deformation of the blood vessels. But uh, uh, even if with those sensor modalities to really extract uh, blood pressure accurately, you also need a very good uh, biomechanics models that can use those non-invasively measured parameters uh, to extract blood pressure. Which one is the uh, I would say those uh, electrophysiological uh, signals. And there is also, actually, I didn't mention um, bioimpedance analysis. So. Uh, there, there. Uh, um, I have a collaborator, Professor Rusbet Jafari. He is uh, using actually bioimpedance analysis to also extract blood pressure. Um, uh, the idea is uh, when blood flows, um, there is a, a, a change of the bioimpedance instantaneously, and uh, by uh, analyzing the blood flow, the, the bioimpedance uh, uh, change changes, he can extract the blood flow rate. So uh, of course, uh, um, uh, doing fusion is another challenge, uh, which parameters modalities can really indicate things like stress or pain. So that's still um, uh, uh, under debate. But uh, I think uh, this is uh, uh, why uh, e-tattoos is uh, still um, so exciting and uh, um, challenging and uh, uh, keep us uh, um, uh, energized every day. There are still a lot of uh, uh, unsolved problems. All right. So, any any other um, questions regarding the overview? Uh, yes. What what what's the of the endurance of the post Uh huh. The skin will go multiple sizes of endurance. Yeah. So it shouldn't be the deep, shouldn't break. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, actually, that's a great question. So um, the idea of using the serpentine ribbon is that we try to keep all the materials involved in the ETA2 uh, to deform within the elasticity regime, even if the skin stretches by 20% or more. And in that case, under elasticity, there is no fatigue. Right, but of course, uh, it's uh, there is a local strain concentration, and for metal, there will be plasticity if it's beyond the one percent, and the fatigue will happen, and fracture will eventually occur at the crest of the ribbons. For polymers, uh, some polymers also have uh, uh, fatigue issues, plasticity and fatigue issues, and uh, some of them can even develop microvoids and under uh, cyclic loading, the voids can grow, coalesce and grow, and also rupture the polymer. So um, fracture mechanics can be uh, well applied to those kind of uh, scenarios. And uh, even um, like hydrogels can still fatigue. Yeah, so fatigue is a big issue. Uh, currently for device papers, uh, people uh, try to demonstrate uh, actually uh, cycling um, beyond the, at least 1,000 cycles, sometimes 10,000 cycles. Yeah, so, so um, it is a, a still a child. And uh, not just the, the device itself, sometimes the interface between the device and the rigid components is the most vulnerable. So I will, I will talk a little bit more about the integration and the interfaces. <laughs> so, um, uh, I, I will not be able to go through a lot of details, but uh, just uh, want to highlight that uh, stretchable conductors can be achieved by 
uh, either intrinsically stretchable materials or stretchable structural design. We already showed you serpentine. Later, we will show you some mesh or micro crack design. And in terms of the stretchable materials, uh, still, um, there is nothing uh, that can be comparable with metal. Um, those uh, uh, metal could uh, be thin film or could be nanowire uh, closely packed. Their conductivity are uh, the highest so far. Um, but uh, for some carbon materials, uh, they are approaching uh, metal conductivity, but organic conductors are still uh, uh, falling behind. And uh, th there's still a lot of work to be done there, a lot of opportunities as well. There are also composites, uh, hydrogels. So they are very soft, biocompatible, but yeah, not good uh, conductivity. And uh, uh, liquid metal, uh, that's only uh, one order lower than uh, solid metal. So that's why, and the liquid metal is liquid, right? Intrinsically stretchable. That's why it's also very, very popular for uh, e-tattoos, all right? So uh, let's take a look at metal thin film first. Actually, this was my uh, PhD thesis. So uh, we try to uh, tell people that, yes, usually when you think about metal, it's ductile, right? But when you have a metal thin film, let's say just a few micron thing, uh, it's not very stretchable. The end by end of stretchability is usually less than 5%. Take an example of your aluminum foil. Is it stretchable? It's aluminum supposed to be ductile. Aluminum foil is not stretchable. Why? Because when it's a thin film, all the ductility, all the plasticity concentrate at a, a local neck. This is called a strain localization, right? That's why, even though it's a ductile material, it's not very stretchable. However, if you support the metal thin film by a plastic substrate, it has to have certain stiffness. If it's a PDMS or Ecoflex, it doesn't work because the two metal, they appear like air. They are too soft compared with metal. Yeah, six orders of difference. So it has to be something stiff like a PET or polyamide. They are very stiff, but they are stretchable. Tactone, you can stretch tactone by 70% without breaking it, but it, you, you need to use a machine to stretch. You cannot use your hand, but it's stretchable. So stretchability and stiffness have some difference, right? So that's why, Actually, uh, uh, it's uh, your, your um, potato chip bags are, are a little bit stretchable because the aluminum is laminated by a layer of polymer, right? And uh, fortunately on the market, there are a lot of uh, metallized polymer, big rows you can buy. You can customize how thin, what's the material, what's the adhesion layer you want to use. You can buy big rows of them. And um, uh, you can also deposit uh, metal thin film on polymer substrate. Usually we use uh, polyamide, right? And uh, that's how we first fabricated our uh, electronic tattoos. Those are, although they look like just the gold, they are all actually gold supported by polyamide. None of them are freestanding gold. Okay, freestanding gold is brittle, very brittle, as brittle as silicon. And uh, my lab actually buy a lot of those big rows and uh, do a cut and paste process to generate those uh, e-tattoos within minutes. I will show you. So those are um, metal thin films, uh, very uh, conductive, uh, chemically very stable and uh, well industrialized. You can leverage that uh, to build your devices. Metallic nanomaterials, um, uh, they are uh, also good conductivity and uh, solution processed, right? Can be large scale and uh, it can also be porous, but uh, uh, sometimes they are quite expensive and uh, you have to have the right formulation um, to, to, to disperse it and uh, cast it. Uh, and in this uh, actually uh, landmark work uh, by De Hyun, uh, they achieved this uh, kind of uh, two scum uh, kind of pattern of uh, um, golden nanowires uh, using the Maragoni effect. And uh, by this uh, very closely packing uh, metallic nanowires, they have achieved um, conductivity almost comparable with the bulk metal and stretchability also um, beyond 1000%. This is the new world record now, all right? Uh, but of course it's still very costly, but this is uh, uh, really pushing the boundary. 
Liquid metal, uh, it's uh, uh, 10 times uh, less conductive than bulk metal, um, but it's uh, really intrinsically stretchable and uh, morphable, right, uh, uh, to any shape you need. And uh, also biocompatibility has been proved to be very safe for epidermal use, right? But usually they need this kind of microfluidic channel, or if you do a printing, uh, the, the thickness is uh, definitely thicker than metal thin films. And uh, the adhesion is uh, uh, something you have to really work hard to bond them to any material. That's why people prefer to still use the um, microfluidic channels. Uh, and the terminal connections, you cannot uh, readily solder to liquid metal, right? So that's another concern, but it's very soft, right? And it is um, also um, very conductive. So, so a lot of people use the uh, liquid metal to make uh, um, e-tattoos. Uh, it can be printed. And uh, <clears throat> carbon-based materials, carbon nanotubes, uh, they can be now grown uh, very well if you have the facility. Um, and uh, they can be highly conductive as well. <clears throat> and uh, the network can be also highly stretchable depending on the substrate you use. So um, uh, there are a lot of uh, substrates you can also use and you can also pattern the uh, carbon nanotube networks. Uh, graphene is another carbon material, but it's a comically thin, right? Single layer of carbon atoms. Um, our group has used the CVD graphene to make a graphene tattoo, and uh, um, uh, Wei Gao and many others are using laser-induced uh, uh, porous graphene to also make uh, um, uh, conductors and uh, chemical sensors. And uh, in terms of conductive polymers, right, P.PSS is the most famous one. Uh, it has good conductivity, uh, but it's still like a four orders lower than bulk metal, okay? What's very unique about P.PSS is that uh, P. Dot is electrically conductive. P.S.S. is this blue uh, shell, right, is uh, ionically conductive. So when you put P.PSS on skin, it always gives you the lowest contact impedance compared with the uh, metal or graphene or, or silver nanowire, okay? PSS. that's because of the ionic conductivity because us, our skin, everything is ionic, right? So uh, if you have an ionically conductive material sitting on the skin, it can lower the contact impedance significantly. But uh, PSS uh, uh, covering P dot is uh, separating the P dot and that's what adding um, the resistivity to the material. So if you choose the correct additive, then you can actually further enhance the conductivity of PSS. There's a lot of work in this field, okay? But so far, um, uh, and it can also be made uh, semi-transparent, but, but uh, so far it's still like a, a few orders lower uh, conductivity than bulk metal. Um, there are semiconducting um, polymers. I am no expert in this field, but uh, we have uh, many um, uh, uh, exciting work and uh, people are trying to make um, semiconducting polymers intrinsically stretchable or embedded in a soft matrix and make this uh, so-called rubbery electronics to be stretchable and uh, still having the semiconducting capability. Hydrogels, like we mentioned, they are mechanically compatible with the skin. They have good biocompatibility, but uh, a major uh, they, they, they are intrinsically stretchable, self-adhesive. Uh, the adhesion can be uh, uh, more than 1,000 joule per meter square, right? Like super, like, like, like a super glue um, and uh, self healable But uh, they have intrinsic limitations that they dehydrate in the air unless you have a very uh, hermetic coating on the surface without compromising the softness and also limiting conductivity like, like P dot. So those are um, active like uh, functional materials. And in terms of substrate, um, we are familiar with those uh, um, PET, polyMA, PMMA, TPU. But I also want to point out that actually for nowadays, a lot of uh, flexible displays, uh, even glasses can be used as a flexible substrate. Why? Because uh, even though it's intrinsically brittle material, um, if it's ultra thin, right? The bending rigidity scales with thickness cubed. 
and the strain scales with thickness uh, linearly. So if it's ultra thin, it can be flexible and uh, without a fracture, right? There, yes? Well, you're coming to it now is when you ask about the ethics, is that a part of your thing? Uh-huh. So, so uh, EcoFlex, uh, there are also a lot of silicone materials um, that are developed specifically for a uh, skin application or, or health application. And they are like a skin soft and uh, 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 very stretchable. Okay, so the EcoFlex is, uh, is silicone? Silicone, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> And uh, um, yeah, there are also other types of cell um, bion and the dragon skin, they are all silicone. And uh, there could also be like a biomaterials uh, that can give you like a biodegradability, right? Or like a um, uh, in vivo compatibility and uh, including things like silk uh, and the nanocellulose and so on, right? Just want to highlight different types of materials. And uh, the structural design is something uh, we can play a lot with. And that also takes a lot of mechanics understanding. We have mentioned a serpentine. It can be um, 1D serpentine, can be 2D serpentine, can be a serpentine uh, filamentary network, right? And, and there are also other designs like for a large area mm, functional material. If you don't want to compromise the area coverage, but you still want to have some stretchability. What do you do? You make cuts. You just make slits. You are not re removing anything, just making slits. And therefore it still has a large area coverage, but it becomes a little softer and stretchable, right? Any question for the material part? And manufacturing and uh, fabrication, of course, uh, microfabrication is uh, the standard way. Even our uh, original ETA2 was uh, uh, fabricated in clean room and transfer printed onto a substrate. It's very time consuming, very high cost, but a very high resolution and the repeatability. Inkjet printing is a free form digital manufacturing. It's very, very popular nowadays. We have a lot of experts our experts here in this conference as well. And, um, but uh, it's a, a challenging in the sense that you have to have good ink uh, that has good conductivity, that is um, a good viscosity, viscos viscosity, and uh, also not clogging your cartridge, right? Your, your print head. <clears throat> and uh, your substrate wettability has to be tuned correctly as well. Screen printing is uh, uh, another very low cost um, uh, 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 fabrication. Uh, actually, uh, we also have many experts in this field. Uh, my group used uh, screen printing to, to uh, fabricate some of the PDOT devices, which we have not published. But the key is uh, you have to have a good stencil, right? And uh, you have to have a, a, a good hand to do the um, uh, scraping. And uh, the resolution is limited, of course, uh, depend, uh, determined by the stencil. So uh, this is, uh, so those are called uh, additive manufacturing, right? The printing is additive manufacturing. But uh, uh, I want to ad advocate for uh, subtractive manufacturing, uh, which our group developed. So we start with a, a you know, metallized polymer. It could be a gold on PET, and it was supported by a thermal release tape. And we just put it into a mechanical or, or laser carbon plotter. It can carve all those uh, seams. And then I just uh, remove, uh, just manually, all the extraneous material and uh, paste the rest devices onto a target substrate. The whole process, we call it literally cut and paste process. It's a subtractive, we're, we're removing material. But it's a free form, it's still digital, right? Just a digital cutter. It's dry, completely dry, no chemicals involved. It can be multi-material, you can do cut and paste of multiple sheets onto the same substrate, right? And it's solderable. You can directly solder on those terminals. It can be large area and it can be potentially row-to-row -row compatible. What kind of cutters we use? Uh, originally, we use a mechanical cutter plotter. It's developed to cut vinyl sign, uh, paper or vinyl signage, right? Now you can use it to cut, why not? Aluminum foil, copper foil, gold foil, right? And nowadays, we 
use a laser cutter that can give us uh, down to a 50 micron resolution. The mechanical cutter uh, resolution is uh, 250 ribbon width, the uh, serpentine ribbon, but it's uh, much cheaper, right? This is $300. This is a uh, uh, 300,000, yeah? Electro spinning, uh, that's another um, uh, method where you can generate a big uh, porous uh, mat of uh, materials of your choice. But uh, it's not that easy to pattern. And the thickness is also a little difficult to control, but it's very large area and low cost. <coughs> we uh, want to offer a summary of the fabrication methods in terms of resolution, advantages and disadvantages. We are still preparing our uh, uh, review paper for chemical reviews, and it will be in that paper. <laughs> so uh, here I want to highlight some of those uh, uh, system level integration, because as we mentioned, even though you have a good material, you have a good design, but if you don't have an interface connecting to your electronics, the device performance is still not complete, right? So um, the question is, even though you have very soft, very thin device, how can you connect it to very thick, very rigid electronics like a PCB board? Um, earlier, people pro proposed this a gradual change of stiffness, right? You can gradually change the material with different modules, or you can gradually change the width of the ribbon, right? And we want to propose another idea, which we call a uh, heterogeneous serpentine. So the serpentine uh, graphene eta two is a uh, ultra thin, sub micron thin, and uh, very skin conformable. And we can laminate a uh, gold um, polyimide ribbon um, over the serpentine. It's also a serpentine. So the two serpentines fully overlap within a period, and they just uh, simply touch each other by Wiener Wars force. And the gold graphene contact resistance is only one ohm, very small contact resistance, well known. But then the gold can be soldered or they, it can connect to a watch easily, right? Graphene, uh, no way you can solder or, 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 or directly contact it. And we proved both uh, numerically and experimentally that this kind of hetero serpentine is as stretchable as a homogeneous serpentine. So serpentine, again, is not material dependent, it's geometry dependent, stretchability and softness. And there is a multi-layer assembly and integration of materials. And uh, uh, the via is, is tricky, right? You can use laser to uh, drill holes in your dielectrics and uh, um, with a little bit solder, or we are just using cutters to cut holes and use uh, copper pads and uh, uh, ACF anisotropic cohesive film as the via. And uh, in our case, actually, for this multi layer tattoo, we can, after use, we can disassemble it and just dispose the bottom layer that was in direct contact with the skin and reuse, recycle all those electronics layer. We have circuit readout layer, we have a NFC wireless layer. And uh, there are other <laughs> types of assembly or encapsulation methods um, that can be used to uh, integrate the whole system. And another topic that is of interest to either two is uh, how do you transfer to the skin after you have the device fabricated? One is to use a stamp, right? Just like a transfer printing, but instead of transfer printing onto Ecoflex, you can directly transfer print a tattoo on skin. And uh, we want to promote uh, this uh, Catan transfer, which means that if you have a large area in tattoo, it's very difficult to use one stamp to transfer. And uh, what we use is a piece of cloth. And instead of a, a conformable, like all in one contact, we are doing a rolling contact, yeah? Doing a rolling contact, uh, giving you almost like a point to point contact. And that gives you the best uh, preservation of the shape of your serpentine. If you use just a conformable, like a one time contact, it can distort your serpentine a lot. So it can give you a very large area coverage. And uh, there is also tattoo paper assisted transfer, right? A commercial tattoo paper has uh, either starch or um, other water soluble adhesive. So if you smear some water, the paper absorbs the water and dissolves away the water soluble adhesive. And uh, you can easily leave uh, the 
graphene it has two on the skin, yeah? And there is also a water-assisted transfer. If you have ultra-thin membrane under surface tension, um, it can be inside a pipette, right? Once you uh, deliver the ultra-thin membrane uh, with water on the skin because of the surface tension, it can self-deploy and conform to the skin very well, right? So there is water assisted, not just on skin, on all 3D surface, you can dip a 3D surface into a water uh, bath uh, with um, uh, ink floating on the surface. It can also conformably transfer the ink to any 3D surface. And there is even draw on skin, right? If you can have a stencil, and this is like a, a little bit like a screen printing, but instead you use a pen and then you directly draw on skin through the openings on the stencil. And uh, you have to, of course, develop a very good ink, right? And uh, sometimes people even use pencil uh, to directly uh, draw on skin through a stencil, right? But uh, after you draw it on skin, there's a limited process. You cannot solder. <laughs> you cannot uh, uh, attach uh, uh, top layers that easily. And adhesion is another big topic, right? Uh, without uh, added adhesive, we need ultra thin, ultra soft membrane. Uh, you can tune the adhesion by using mechanical structure like a gecko inspired pillars or octopus inspired craters. Or you can use uh, chemical ways, yeah, to enhance the adhesion between devices and skin. Uh, using chemical ways, you can enhance it uh, um, by two orders of magnitude. Uh, breathable uh, ETA tools are very important for long-term um, health of the skin and also for accurate sensing. So you need to develop a, a, a skin-friendly uh, porous substrate as well as um, conductors. And in terms of functionalities, uh, there are a lot of electrophysiological sensing you can do on the brain. It is EEG. And Professor Rogers developed this uh, uh, large area uh, ETA2 that can be applied on uh, uh, the head, but it has to be a bold head. That is one of the biggest uh, limitations of ETA2 is that still it's not very hair compatible, right? You can even measure EEG from the ear. If you put a, a ear conformable electrodes, you can measure also very high quality EEG. Uh, EMG sensing, it can be large area, multi, um, channels, and it can even be like from the finger, like even very thin muscle, you can still measure e EMG. Bio Z sensing, that's what I mentioned uh, from Professor Ruth Bejafari. Um, they are measuring the, uh, uh, again, uh, 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 blood pressure out of the uh, impedance wave. And there are a lot of uh, mechanical uh, sensing uh, e skins, uh, e tattoos, right? I'm not going to go through the details, but it can be uh, gold, liquid metal, uh, uh, conduct uh, CNT doped uh, PDMS, and uh, hydrogel, and the pressure sensing, right? So uh, uh, wearable pressure sensors are mainly for like uh, object recognition or 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 uh, pulse wave measurement. There are, there are many different types you can use. Optically, um, basically uh, you can use OLED or you can just use a micro LED. And there are for like a PPG measurement, right? From the, uh, 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 tuned by the uh, blood oxygenation, or you can um, do UV uh, dosage measurement, how many UV received by your skin. Energy harvesting, I, I, I don't do research in this field, but uh, uh, energy harvesting and storage is a must uh, have component for uh, ETA tools to be wireless and mobile. So, so very important and also very exciting field. So I, I don't want to uh, uh, talk too much about applications. Uh, because uh, given those materials and uh, uh, assembly manufacturing method, you, you can do unlimited things. I just want to highlight some of our work, which is a dual mode ETA2 that can measure uh, ECG and SCG simultaneously. ECG has the QRS complex, SCG has the mitral valve closing opening peaks. And uh, combining the two, 
it can give you like pre-ejection period, left ventricular ejection time. So give you much more insight about the heart uh, electrical and mechanical uh, activity. And by uh, some uh, algorithm, we can extract things like a, a stroke volume or cardiac output. And it can be very ambulatory, uh, more than 24 hours without uh, uh, like a discontinuity. And this is a large area, um, uh, uh, EMG ETA2 transferred by Cartan transfer, and it can be used for sign language interpretation, uh, also for the human robot interface for the amputee. It can control robotic hand. And this is graphene ETA2. It's a really uh, not visible even uh, on the face. And we're measuring the eye rotation induced EOG signal. And the EOG signal can be wirelessly transmitted to a laptop. The laptop can interpret the EOG and uh, 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 develop a command to control the drone. So the drone is flying to his eyesight, up, down, left, right. But uh, you cannot tell how he is doing that. There's no camera on the drone, and uh, you cannot see the ETA2 but the ETA2 is here. It's the graphene ETA2 ultra thin, imperceptible. And I also want to highlight this uh, closed loop um, diabetic management ETA2 made by Daehyung, where on the one side, he can measure the glucose. On the other side, he has micro needles that can um, deliver metformin under heat. So when he detects high glucose, he can uh, trigger the microneedles to deliver metformin to lower the glucose. So in summary, uh, ETA tools could be uh, applied anywhere on the body except a very hairy part. I will give you a discussion uh, whether we have a remedy and it can have a really a lot of applications uh, that uh, um, are still uh, uh, a lot of opportunities to explore. So uh, I just want to use the last few minutes to discuss with you all, actually, uh, what's the future of ETA tattoos after looking at uh, this uh, quick uh, overview, right? Uh, how about hairs, large area coverage, right? So one idea I want to propose is uh, whether we can directly print uh, uh, active uh, materials on the skin. So currently we already have 3D printing printers. Right? And uh, if we can develop conductive inks that are skin compatible, conductive, and can be directly printed on the curvilinear surface of our skin and it can dry under room temperature, then we can have e tattoos that can even uh, wet the hairy zones. Is that right? So that's just an idea I want to throw out there. And how about closed loop sensing diagnosis treatment, right? In this case, um, you can use the cloud if you have internet connection, but if you don't, we need edge computing plus a stimulation and drug delivery uh, management. Uh, Wei is actually already uh, actively doing a lot of those uh, uh, edge computing work, right? Quantification of mental versus uh, physical stress, right? We need multi-modality fusion. A reusable e tattoos. Uh, currently, those ultra thin ones are not reusable, but uh, uh, we want to still reuse the electronics and the battery, hopefully. And personalized e tattoos, right? How can we do modular and reconfigurable design so that you already have the components for different people coming in? You just uh, um, assemble different components for the specific person. Images for metaverse, um, there is already emerging work about a haptic actuation on skin, right? Images for robots, they are called e-skins, okay? Any ideas you want to share? That's the end of my talk.